Good evening and welcome to the uh, first conference that we've set up for this year uh, through the uh, my office, Ulster County H Historian, and I do want to thank the History Co Committee for once again uh, wor working on this co conference wi with me. Um, I, uh, so we've called this one expanding the narrative, picking up from last year, which we were doing, but it's added to that facing the challenges of COVID. It's been a difficult year and a half for local organizations here. And at this point in time, I, I don't know about your mail, but one day I hear about an annual um, fundraising event for an organization that's going to be live and then the next day they cancel it and none of us are really sure what to do going forward how much time and energy to commit to in person uh, whether we should be uh, talking about um, mixed zoom and live experiences or whether we should be all zoom it's it's difficult it's a difficult path to weave. And uh, being 74 myself, I stopped going back to the gym and I always wear my mask when I go into supermarkets. So it's a difficult road to hoe. We each have to make up our own choices how we're going to do that. But I thought that uh, this um, conference here was to replace our usual historians conference where we educate and work with the historical co co community to you know uh, broaden our work and and usually not open to the community but since this is zoom uh we thought of do, doing that too and the, and the topic that we thought would really work is rather than than this, talking about what happened in the past is how we could use what we've determined to go forward. And I know um, Hack's uh, story starts in the back when, but they're still also working and going forward and they create this thing. But it also, you know, the, the I've been watching the Pomeroy Foundation. I don't know, uh, Stephen, if that's you're do doing, but there seems to be a lot more coming out of the organization in terms of what you're doing and the programs that are available. And they've tantalized me in many ways. And one of the things I've always wanted to do uh, since I've be become the historian, you know, the county hi historian, and haven't gotten around to because of other things is to develop like tours throughout the county where you could have you know that highlight the different culture groups that highlight the different hi historical things that are not specific to one place but to many places and also just to now broaden by using this time to think about what are the sites of interest for the african-american community that would be worth a sign or the Native American community that might be worth a sign. And so I'm very happy that that the Pomeroy Fo Foundation agreed to participate and Steve Bodner agreed to be the presenter. So I'm welcome, Steve. Also for uh, the History Alliance of Kingston, I went to the first few meetings of that and uh, I do have to say that I just am thrilled to see local agencies working together to create a platform that all could use um, to um, keep their collections and just the concept of local hi history alive during a difficult time when people were um, stuck in their own shells and many like me are still stuck in our shells but uh, so I was thrilled to be able to present a local spontaneous um, you know uh, event you know a, a coming together of organizations on their own uh, not a lot of, of fanfare and building up, just deciding that it was time to come together and work to, together. 
So I'm thrilled in terms of a local concept to be able to bring that information to you and hope that hat hack will be around for many years and hope that uh, more people will be participating in it in the uh, future so um, um the we will have a question and answer period after each pre presentation uh we'll handle that by doing a live q q a participants who wish to ask a question, uh, you'll be asked to raise your hands electronically, and you'll do that by going down to the reactions button on the bottom of your screen. And when you click on that, you'll have a menu that opens up and you'll click on the uh, raise your hand uh, icon or word. And uh, that will show up in the order that people hit the button and then Karen Le Levine, who is um, disguised as the seal of uh, Ulster County there, she will come on board and, hi, hi Karen, she'll come on board and she'll lead the uh, question and answer because I am electronically challenged and she is our Meister here tonight. So, um, and then you will ask your question live to the presenter at that, that point. So uh, I also do want to let you know that there will be an upcoming co conference on December 9th. To Toby Carey will speak about his do documentary Rails to the, to the Catskills, showing clips from the documentary and discussing research and sources. And that'll also be at seven o'clock. And I'll send out a notice for that in a, in a month or so with uh, the link to register for that. So um, without any further ado, I can turn you over to Steve Bodner. Uh, Steve joined the uh, William G. Pomeroy Foundation in 2018 um, as their first communication manager and currently serves as a consultant to the organization. Steve brings a passion for history and expertise in communication together with Hundreds of Pomeroy Foundation grantees promote and celebrate their community's history. I think I left out the word help. At the Pomeroy Foundation, Steve is responsible for a range of marketing and communication efforts, including public relations, social media, and copywriting. He's re represented the Pomeroy Foundation at numerous marker de dedications and conferences in multiple states. Uh, he earned a BA in English and jur journalism from the University of New Hampshire and a master's in communication and me media technologies from the Rochester in Institute of Technology. So Steve, welcome and thank you for being here this, this evening. And the title of your talk is to celebrate local hi history with Pomeroy Foundation roadside markers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. Uh, I just wanted to uh, thank you and Richard Hapner for uh, giving us this opportunity to be able to share some information with you tonight about the Palmer Foundation and what we do. Um, I have uh, some slides I'm gonna be going through as well as some notes that uh, I'll be sharing with you on that. Uh, and tonight you'll be uh, learning uh, about the spark that ignited uh, the foundation's mission and our two main initiatives. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen now uh, to bring up that presentation. And um, I'm just going to start off with uh, introducing you uh, first to our founder and trustee, Bill Pomeroy, uh, and how his personal experience prompted the creation of the William G. Pomeroy Foundation and our mission. And tonight I'll also be giving a special focus to the uh, For History side of things. So uh, our mission, we are committed to supporting the celebration and preservation of community history and to raising awareness and supporting research and improving the quality of care for patients and their families facing a blood cancer diagnosis. And this dual mission really begins with a story. And that story is uh, about Bill. 
So in 2004, Bill started his fight with acute myeloid leukemia, an aggressive form of leukemia, and his survival was in doubt. To live, he would need a stem cell transplant. Fortunately, Bill found a perfect match through the Be The Match bone marrow registry and was able to receive a stem cell transplant that saved his life. Bill felt that should he survive, he would help others in a similar situation. And by the way, Bill's doing great and we can't keep up with him. Uh, Bill was fortunate to find that donor, Brent uh, from Texas. And as you can see on this slide, uh, he is uh, with Brent on the right. Uh, and he was invited to be the guest of honor at his wedding. Unfortunately, uh, many others do not have the same outcome as Bill. According to the Be The Match Registry, Black or African-American patients have only a 23% chance of finding a match. And that's in comparison to 77% for Caucasian patients. Uh, this was the genesis for the foundation's first initiative. And that's helping to diversify the bone marrow registry uh, for uh, anyone from any ethnic background so that they can find a match. Uh, as a result, uh, we have conducted and funded hundreds of bone marrow registries, uh, bone marrow drives in diverse communities and registered over 26,000 people to the Be The Match registry and have 118 donor patient matches, which we're very proud of. So now that I've touched base about the For Life side, uh, I wanna bring us into the For History side of our mission. So historic markers have a real and positive impact on uh, communities. And right now you might be asking yourself, well, why historic markers? Uh, so don't worry, we're gonna get into that with the rest of this presentation. Historic markers have been Bill's passion for decades. When he was a child, he would ride along in his father's 1952 Chrysler Windsor. And every time they'd see a marker, they'd pull over and read it together. And that was a really incredible father-son bonding experience for, uh, for Bill. And that's something he never forgot. That passion stayed with him uh, and spurred the foundation's second initiative to help people celebrate their community's history by providing fully funded grants for historic roadside markers. Now, as I said, the historic markers have a real and positive impact on their locations. First, they help us preserve our important community history and at the same time help to generate and promote historic tourism and economic development. They also enhance pride of place for the area residents. And on more than one occasion, we have heard people say that they have no idea about the history in their backyard until the marker is installed in their community. Now, this leads to my last point. There are educational and cultural benefits uh, to tell these often forgotten stories. And today, the Pomeroy Foundation offers six signature marker programs, all of which I'm gonna share a little bit of information with you uh, in the slides to come. And beyond our marker programs that are housed within the foundation, we also have partnered with some very terrific organizations to fund projects for new marker trails, as well as pre-existing official state marker programs. And as of today, we have funded over 1,500 markers and plaques nationwide from East Coast to West Coast, all the way to Alaska. And uh, tonight, I'm gonna begin with our most recognizable program, uh, our New York State Historic Marker Program. So uh, this is the program that started it all. Uh, in the late 1930s, New York State stopped funding historic markers. And in the decades that followed, there was a gap in the funding. And our founder, Bill, he recognized that that was a community need. Since Bill launched our New York State program in 2006, the Pomeroy Foundation has continued to expand. The program began in a single county, in Onondaga County, where the foundation is located, and now encompasses every county in the entire state. And on this slide, we have a couple of examples of markers that we funded in Ulster County. Uh, and uh, Ulster County is home to 10 Pomeroy-funded markers, uh, three of them in our New York State, uh, or six of them in our New York State marker grant program, and also markers in our National Register program and one from our Historic Canals program. Uh, and you can locate them all on our website's marker map feature, which I'm gonna highlight later of how you can access that. And I'll also mention on that uh, intro slide to the conference, there's also the marker for the Four Corners uh, in Kingston. So I just wanted to give that uh, a shout out as well. 
Now, uh, our New York State Marker Program commemorates historic people, places, events, or things during the time frame 1970 or 1740 to 1922. The photo you see here is from the marker dedication at the last surviving residence owned and lived in by Frederick Douglass, located in Rochester, New York. Now, using primary sources to support a marker inscription is what sets your markers apart. So what exactly is a primary source document? Primary sources are firsthand testimonies or direct pieces of evidence most often created at the event. These could include a personal diary, a photograph, newspaper clippings, and so on. Secondary source is a piece of history that is one or more steps removed from the event. For example, textbooks or magazine articles that analyze the event and are not directly related to it. Uh, since primary sources of evidence are from the past and are as close as possible to the actual event, they are the most direct and most certain and the most minor filtered data sources. As stories get told over the years, the details get dropped and there are changes of tone and emphasis and errors get introduced to that material. Additionally, secondary sources can raise a bias based on the creator's purpose and point of view. This slide shows just a few examples uh, of primary sources and other common primary sources also include deeds, birth, marriage, and death certificates, letters, business records, and incorporations, tax records, cemetery headstones. Now remember, by obtaining a marker, you're doing a service to your community and the public at large. The inscription on your marker matters and will stand for generations to come. And again, using primary sources is what sets your marker apart. So if your grant is approved by the Pomeroy Foundation, you know you will be receiving the gold standard of historic markers. It's like the good housekeeping seal of approval. We keep all of the source material on file if any questions come up down the line, and we have committed to our grant applicants and the public at large that if the William G. Pomeroy Foundation funds a historic marker, they can be assured that the facts presented are indisputable today and in the future. That's a promise that we can only keep if we have primary source documentation on file to support the text of a marker. And on our website, wgpfoundation.org, uh, we have additional information about primary sources that you can use as a point of reference throughout the application process. So now that we've covered our New York State program and primary sources, we're gonna take a closer look at our other signature marker programs. First, I'd like to showcase our newest marker program, which pays homage to community food dishes. The Hungry for History grant program celebrates America's food history by telling stories of local and regional food specialties across the United States. This program is designed to commemorate the significant food dishes created prior to 1960 and the role they played in defining American culture and forging community identity. Hungry for History is intended to help communities nationwide put the spotlight on their renowned locally and regionally created food dishes with historic roadside markers. The very first Hungry for History marker commemorates salt potatoes in central New York's iconic summertime side dish. This marker that you see here on this slide is located at the Salt Museum in Onondaga Lake Park on the outskirts of the city of Syracuse. And uh, here are a few photos from the dedication ceremony. And here's another shot. And the historical reenactors you see on the right are playing the Keefe brothers who first popularized the dish by making it a commercial success in their tavern. The National Register Signage Grant Program. Now, this grant program was established in 2013 to commemorate public properties and historic districts on the National Register of Historic Places, which is administered by the National Park Service. Many do not realize that when a property or a district is placed on the National Register, the designation does not include funding for a marker or a plaque. As a result, many of these historic sites and properties do not have any signage. So we bridge that gap by providing grants so that public properties and historic districts can very publicly commemorate their placement and share their achievements with the community. This program is offered nationwide and provides each grant recipient with a choice of a roadside marker or a wall mounted plaque, depending on the installation location and preference. There are no grant deadlines and you can apply throughout the year. 
And if the property is already on the National Register, that's all the proof that you'll need. If you cannot locate the original designation letter, we can help. We also offer a nine by 13 bronze plaque through the National Register program, and applicants may select between two different designs upon grant acceptance. And on this slide, on this slide, you can see the two different examples of the bronze plaque that we offer. Now, this is a fun program, legends and lore. I have to ask the question, does your community have a great piece of folklore that should be shared? These markers share community tales, including myths, legends, folk tales, place name, anecdotes, superstitions, and more. And here are a couple of legends and lore firsts. Uh, on the left, the Naomi Weiss marker was the first one in North Carolina. And on the right, the Legends and Lore marker for Leather Bridges was the very first one in the state of Louisiana. Now here's a couple of examples in New York. So primary sources are not required for the Legends and Lore grant program, although we do require that the application uh, includes documents demonstrating that the folklore they wish to commemorate is common knowledge to the community at large and that it has been shared for one gen from one generation to the next. Legends and Lore is accepted in states where the Pomeroy Foundation has partnerships with a statewide folklore related organization. So that of course includes New York uh, and these folklore related organizations help us vet our applications. Uh, the other states include Alabama, Connecticut, Idaho, Louisiana, Missouri, North Carolina, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Vermont, and West Virginia. Historic canals. So our historic transportation canal program is another nationwide program. Uh, transportation canals are considered the precursor to interstate highways and help facilitate the movement of goods and people and help spur development uh, leading to the overall expansion of the nation. This program commemorates the history of these important historic transportation canals across the United States. As you can see, grant recipients are offered a choice between two canal themed marker designs. And one fun fact I'd like to point out is that our most distant marker is a historic transportation canal marker commemorating the Hood Canal where seaplanes would land and take off uh, starting in the 1940s. And it's 4,500 miles away from our office in Syracuse, all the way in Anchorage, Alaska. Now here we have a rare surviving example of an Erie Canal lock tender's house located in Jordan, New York, just outside of Syracuse. And for this program, uh, canal markers must be installed near an existing or a former canal site and recognize a historical fact that occurred more than 50 years from the year of the application. So currently that year is 1971. The Patriot Burials Marker Program began with a partnership with the Empire State Society of the Sons of the American Revolution in order to ensure that the burial ground of patriots who fought in or were involved with the fight for American independence are properly marked and not only for today, but for future generations. While this program is currently limited to New York, we are working with the Sons of the American Revolution chapters in other states with the goal to expand this program nationwide. And those interested in obtaining a Patriot Burials marker should reach out to their uh, local SAR chapter for guidance. So who can apply? For all of our marker grant pro programs, applicants must be one of the following, a local state or federal government entity, a nonprofit academic institution or a 501c3 organization. We have a, set up a very straightforward application process that can be completed online, making it easy for people to apply. If your application is approved, we provide fully funded grants that cover the entire cost of the marker, poll, and shipping. We send the check to the applying organization right up front, so there's no matching requirements or uh, reimbursement requirements with any of our marker programs. Application deadlines will vary depending on the specific marker grant program, so please visit our website at wgpfoundation.org to learn more about the application process for each marker program, as well as to view a complete schedule of grant deadlines. In addition to our signature marker grant programs, we also have a number of partner marker programs that we support. 
the women's suffrage markers uh, that we've established throughout the country in partnership with the National Collaborative for Women's History sites have been especially popular. And we're also excited to announce that the first marker on the North Carolina Civil Rights Trail was installed this month with many more on the horizon. In addition to our special interest pro, uh, in addition to our special uh, marker program uh, partnerships, we also have partnerships with uh, states and their official marker programs. And we're the ones who provide the funding for that. Uh, it started with our state marker program in uh, Ohio with the Ohio History Connection back in 2016. And since then, we've grown to include the Missouri Historical Society, the State Historical Society of Iowa, the Illinois Historical Society, and the Wisconsin Historical Society. And we're excited to fund their existing state marker programs and help them to tell the untold stories in their states, especially from underrepresented populations. So as I mentioned before, I wanted to share a great resource you can find right on our website, wgpfoundation.org. And that's our interactive digital marker map. And it's one of the most popular features on our website. The map illustrates where Pomeroy funded markers are located across the country. And as you can see from this slide, uh, you can access the map uh, directly uh, from our website's homepage with just a click of a button. Now, then it brings up a map. And this map illustrates, again, the Pomeroy funded markers that are located all across the country. And the map also has a filter feature. And so you can search and filter in a number of ways, including by marker program, geography, or even keywords. Then on each marker, there's a unique page with the following information, a small detailed map, an address, a GPS coordinates, and a historical write-up. You can also find photos and videos and links at the bottom of the marker uh, write-up. And it's a tremendous historical resource and it's also an excellent way to showcase your marker to the community and beyond. Now, once the application process is over, it's time for grant recipients to celebrate. We love dedication ceremonies. No matter the marker program, dedications often are held to bring people together to recognize the important histor historical point that's being commemorated. They'll often include speeches from local and regional politicians, along with live musical performances, historical reenactments, ribbon cuttings, history talks, and more. And even parades like this one. And this was a dedication that I happened to attend in person as well. And so whether the event is big or small, they're great for community pride, and most importantly, to generate interest in local history. Now, our historic markers have received lots of media attention from communities all across the state and nationwide. Here's a couple of examples. And here's a few more, including some of uh, the news outlets in your broader region I'm sure you're very familiar with. There's also a lot of excitement on social media, and it's been a great source for grant recipients and people in local communities to share their testimonials and generate buzz about their marker. And these are just a couple of examples that I pulled from Facebook and Twitter. Now, one final item related to markers is our National Historic Marker Day. The foundation created and launched this, this day for the first time earlier this year, and we're gonna be holding it the last Friday of every April, and this, Marker Day encourages communities to maintain their local historic markers by cleaning them and providing an opportunity to celebrate and preserve history. So many of them have not received any care or maintenance for years. This is a great project for families, civic organizations, schools, youth groups, or really anyone who just wants to give back to their community by helping to ensure that the markers are clean, visible, and safe to visit. And all are welcome to participate in National Historic Marker Day. So we hope you'll join us next year on April 29th. Now, in addition to our roadside marker grants, we also provide some special interest grants to history-focused related organizations. And on this slide, I've listed a few grants that we've awarded this year. On our website, under the Grants tab, you will see and be able to explore grants that we've awarded over the past three years. 
That's where you can also learn more about our criteria for special interest grants. We have also partnered with the Museum Association of New York, NANI, on two, two special initiatives. Our most recent collaboration is the Pomeroy Fund for New York State History. This developed as a response to the challenges of the pandemic and the uphill battle faced by many small history related organizations across the state. The foundation provided more than $150,000 to 81 different organizations with budgets under $100,000. Our other collaboration with Manny is to provide need-based scholarships we call professional development grants to qualifying organizations who have not attended a Manny conference in the past two years. And our website has more information for anyone who may be interested in applying in the future. So with that, I thank you again for uh, your attendance here this evening and your interest in what the Pomeroy Foundation does. And I really couldn't be more thrilled to share this information with you and talk about our goal to help people celebrate and commemorate their community's history. Uh, and this is what's important to you and in, in your community. So um, I'm happy to take some Q&A at this point, but our contact information is on this slide. So uh, feel free to connect with us at a later date. Please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and I also encourage you to uh, visit our homepage uh, and sign up for our emails about our grant opportunities and uh, news updates. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, St Stephen. It was great, great to hear uh, all of the wonderful things that the uh, program has to offer. So, uh, thank you. Josh. So we're open now for questions. If anyone ha has them. Okay, Richard, I can bring you in for to ask your question. Thank you, Steve. That was excellent and nice thank to meet you, you for. Finally, um, <laughs> nice to meet you as well. Uh, and, and thank you. I've gotten over the past couple of years. I've gotten a marker out of there, and uh, we also got a small grant out of the, the Museum Association uh, project as well. So, uh, you you may have answered my question. I went on about two years ago. I got a uh, a home here in Woodstock uh, on the National Register. It, it was the home of a of a rather famous artist, uh, George Bellows. Now it's privately owned. There's no 501c3. There's no town ownership over this. And so when I went to look at the possibility of getting a marker, uh, it, I got confused because it said uh, you need a 501c3, you need a town uh, government involvement, those types of things. Mm -hmm. and, and then you also just said in your presentation, however, if you're on the National Register, uh, you can go that route. And, and so that's that's the question I'm asking. How do you go that route? Right, so the property in question is already on the National Register of Historic Places? Yes. It's already been designated? Yes. So with our National Register program, uh, the way that we have it set up is that while, uh, of course, there's a whole myriad of types of properties that are on the National Register, we only provide uh, funding for a marker or a plaque that coincides with a public property or a historic district. And that's only within the National Register program that we administer. Okay. There that's are other I'm circumstances sure. and other programs where the property may be a private property, but with the National Register, we're staying to, to the public. If it's and if it's a private property, what route do you go? Is there a route? If it's a private property, uh, depend, if, it, if it's a qualifying private property, another way to look at it may be a historic marker, um, especially if it's located in New York. Now, if you're looking for an actual National Register related plaque or uh, marker, um, that wouldn't fit the, it, with a private property, it wouldn't necessarily fit the program as it exists now. So that, that would be that context. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, uh, Jeff, you can turn on your microphone. And... Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I'm involved in researching a person here in Ulster County who had a resort uh, 
from about 1951 to 1991. Uh, many of the buildings are still there, but since 1991, the property has changed hands a number of times and the resort has been closed. Um, the current owner uh, is not responding to our appeals to be able to get on the property, take photographs and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I, I think they may have plans for the property. I don't know if they have plans for the buildings, for demolishing them or working with them and developing something else. But I would like to be able to put a marker there um, uh, so that regardless of what happens to the property, people will know it was there and what its significance was. And um, so the question that I have is if a property owner is not open to a historic marker, can the community put one there if there is sufficient backing for a marker, like on uh, a right of way that the county has say, uh, you know, the rights to? Mm -hmm. Wow, Jeff, that's a really interesting question that I actually am not sure that I've heard it asked that specific way before, because that's a very interesting and unique circumstance. Uh, what I can say is that uh, with all of our grant programs, all of our marker grant programs, we require a land use permission letter signed by whoever is in charge of the property where that roadside marker is going to be installed, or in some cases, the, the plaque affixed to a building. Uh, so, uh, you know, really it comes down to, you know, cooperation with whoever the individual or individuals or entity and the responsible party uh, in charge of the property of where that marker would eventually be located. And that is a requirement for you know, as I said, across the board for all of our marker programs. So that letter uh, would be, you know, would be looked at and considered. Um, and those conversations, you know, behind the scenes as to what you're referring to, you know, I think that those would be, you know, community conversations, uh, but we do require that, you know, that proof of, of land use. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Uh, do we have any more questions? Uh, okay, uh, Ray, you can turn on your microphone. Uh, yes, this is very quick. I just want to, if anyone's never applied through this program before, I've managed three markers and I'm an outlier. I'm up in Delaware County, but um, I found when I was dealing with the primary source self, Pomeroy was really helpful in helping to navigate through. And, and you know, we had, I, I was working mostly with Susan Hughes, but, it, you know, whoever's there, it's very helpful. So if you're kind of a little intimidated, there are some issues, you can pick their brains and they might give you some other ideas in terms of finding the primary source. This is for, you know, their regular markers and uh, and I succeeded uh, with three in my, my little town. And uh, so much appreciated as I said, if you're a little leery of it, you know, Pomeroy will really help you um, work it out because, and I appreciate the fact that Pomeroy wants this information to be accurate because we all know we have markers out there that's like, yeah, George Washington did not sleep here and stuff like that. So nice to know the Pomeroy markers are spot on. Thank you, Ray. I really appreciate that, you know, that commentary and sharing that with the group. And that's certainly the case. And you you mentioned Susan Hughes, who is just fantastic to work with uh, in, uh, as a historian, as a researcher. So, uh, yeah, but thank you again for, for your uh, personal insights on, on your experience. Susan, you can ask your question. I don't know if you want to turn your video on. You're welcome to. Um, maybe I won't. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm sitting here on the floor of my bedroom here. So, but um, I'm about to apply for a marker. There was a, uh, an MA uh, Zion Church in New Paltz. Now, I've just put up a full exhibit on this church with probably 30 or more primary source documents from newspapers that show the whole timeline of the church. Might I be able to just kind of take that and 
like, and have you like, would, do I have to send the paperwork or could I just say like, can you use this exhibit that I've just put up here? Cause it's got every bit of information I have on it. Right. That, that's a great, that is a great question about, you know, how do you present the primary sources in the application process? So uh, I'll just give you a very quick overview, but then, uh, you know, I encourage you to check out the specific marker program on the website, the primary sources tab to read through that material to make sure that what you're doing coincides with that. Uh, mm -hmm. And then also if you have questions, you can also follow up with us. And then Susan Hughes, uh, our historian, she'll be able to guide you through that process. But uh, it sounds like uh, generally each individual fact that you'd need to present on the marker, on the inscription, will need its own piece of primary source evidence. So basically you'd have to uh, perhaps extract elements of that and highlight the areas where that particular primary source uh, fact is located in the materials that you have. So you basically have to curate it in a sense so that the vetting process uh, will be able to, you know, determine, you know, those particular facts. Okay. All right. Thank you. And and I, I just haven't haven't looked. Um, but when is the um, the cycle now for applying? Just which county are you in? Ulster. You are okay. So. Uh, we just passed what we call our letter of intent deadline, and that's when people acknowledge to us that they have the intention of completing an application. That deadline passed on September 13th, and then the final grant application deadline for Ulster County is going to be October 4th. So if there is anybody out there in the audience tonight that has their application pending in draft right now, uh, you know, feel free to work on that and submit that before October 4th. And then about this time or earlier than this time, uh, next year, the next grant round will, will open back up for Ulster County. Okay, so I missed it. Okay, all right, thank you. You're welcome. Do we have more questions? If not, I'll hand it back over to Jeff. Great, thank you. Thank you, everyone. If you have any uh, you know, follow-up questions, you think of anything after the fact, again, please, uh, please reach out to us. And uh, certainly our contact information is on our website, wgpfoundation.org. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jeff. Yes, Stephen, th thank you very, very much for the uh, presentation. That's great. It's great to have more, more of a feeling for it and everything. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay. So our next presentation is on the History Alliance of Kingston, and it's being presented by Taylor Brook and Bill Merchant. What can I say about Taylor? I see his name popping up everywhere. Anytime there's a call for a volunteer, Taylor is there. He's um, He's great. I don't know. I've known him uh, since he first became the uh, uh, Ulster County uh, Ar archivist, um, and he's uh, a fast learner. He's a um, energetic person, responds very quickly to anything you ask, and I really uh, appreciate working with him. And uh, Bill Merchant, <laughs> I wish I had half of your energy <laughs> because you also are involved all over the place. You're, uh, you're always going, you're always rushing to and fro and you have an incredibly fertile mind and it's wonderful to be a, in a community with, with you. And I applaud the work that you're doing on the DNH canal. Uh, it's a big project and it needs a big person to do it. And so thank you for uh, doing that. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to you to uh, let us know about Hack. Oh, thank I you, Jeff. Add, I should add that we are a little um, ahead of schedule. So, you know, if you need a little more time to 
elaborate from the time allowance I allowed you. It is, you know, okay. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, and so I'm Taylor Brook, the City of Kingston historian and Ulster County archivist. And uh, thank you, Stephen, as well. The Palmore Foundation does great work, and I can absolutely vouch for them uh, making you verify exactly what's on that marker. The, the county clerk's office is the one who uh, applied for the historic Four Corners marker, and we originally wanted to say that it was the only intersection in of North America with four pre-revolutionary war stone houses. And they told us, well, you better be prepared to prove that every single other intersection in North America does not have a pre-revolutionary war stone house. So they are uh, certainly fair and you can bet that what's on those markers is correct. So tonight, me and Bill, Bill, I'll let you introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Bill Merchant, uh, Deputy Director for Collections, Historian and Curator here at the DNH Canal Historical Society, Vice President of Ulster County Historical, Head of Collections and Board Member at the Century House Historical Society, and President of the DNH Transportation Heritage Council. I Is that love this <laughs> for now. <laughs> So we're going to be talking about the History Alliance of Kingston and uh, how we joined together to make lemonade during the COVID pandemic. So the, the lemon in this metaphor is obviously the pandemic itself. And um, early on in May 2020, when everything started to close down and COVID was really wreaking havoc throughout the world, um, it also wreaked havoc on all of the museums and cultural institutions and every other uh, location really that relied on visitors. And we noticed pretty quickly, um, we being virtually everybody in museums and history that the transition was going to happen into producing digital content. And I, we were approached by Sarah Wasberg Johnson from the Maritime Museum and Sarah Litvin from the Rear Center for Immigrant History. Um, and we noticed we all had the same problem. How do we produce digital content? Um, and we wanted to know what is everyone else doing? And of course, Bill, um, Bill, I consider you the pioneer of digital historic content during the pandemic. Do you wanna maybe uh, just talk a little bit about your, your videos and how that all started? We, we convened a staff meeting. I convened a staff meeting when we realized how serious this would be and said, you know, how often have we said we've got to create more digital content, but we never had time. You know, we, as many of you know, we've got an ambitious project here with the visitor center uh, and the new museum and the Depew Tavern. I'm sitting here uh, tonight. Uh, and, and so we've got a lot on our plate, but we were like, you know, we keep saying we got to do digital. Once COVID hit, we just said, we've got no excuse. I was very fortunate to have Courtney McNamara, now uh, an assistant curator. She's worked her way up. Uh, uh, it's a meritocracy, people. Um, uh, Courtney had done some video editing, and, and I'll sit in the act about history, as you all know, maybe too much, right? Um, so we had an easy time producing content. I just went out with my, my phone and, and started filming stuff in the field, and we started doing a tour of our museum. And, and it, we found it fairly easy, partially because I wasn't afraid to embarrass myself. <laughs> um, but, but now at this remove, we've got over 75 video on, on what we've dubbed DNH TV, our YouTube channel. Our content has been used by uh, colleges, uh, 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 one college class, uh, one of my long form uh, presentations. It's just been a great, we, we reached more people during COVID than we did as a museum, which is a little embarrassing, I guess, but very good for all of us. And a lot of the content that we produce will be linked now in our new museum via QR codes by topic. Um, so this is gonna just live on and on. And we were, we were, uh, We've just been having way too much fun. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the truth? But so we knew instantly we needed to bring Bill in. So even though the organization is called the History Alliance of Kingston, its borders really expand far beyond Kingston from the very beginning. Um, but the name was already locked in and we're really based out of Kingston. But we started to meet and we invited a lot of um, basically all of the other organizations that we could think of. If you wanna to go to the next slide, Bill, um, we started meeting weekly and we thought, well, what do we, how do we start? What do we do? So we, we drafted a mission statement, which you can read here on the screen. Um, we drafted some very informal 
I guess you can call them bylaws or meeting rules. Basically, how are we going to meet? How do we know who talks next? Things like that. Um, and from there, we, we dove right into content. We made a website that you can also see on your screen here, the History Alliance of Kingston.com, which was uh, really generously designed and uh, made entirely by Henry Lonegard from the Century House, um, who I saw spamming chat earlier. So hi, Henry. Um, but he, he made the website. The website is awesome. Check it out. Bill is going to talk later on about some of the um, things that are on the website and some of the projects that are completed and also the project we're really focused on now going forward, because I think originally it was almost just a panic. We got to get content out. And it was honestly easier for all of our different institutions to come together and produce content as a team than each of us doing it separately. And um, there would have inevitably been some overlap. And where, where do people go if they want digital content that's history related? So this, this served multiple purposes. It, it helped us as institutions brainstorm with each other. And it hopefully helped the public in giving it kind of a, a history clearinghouse that you can just go straight here. The website links to all of the participating organizations from there. Um, and it's really a one-stop shop for, for history in the area. So after we had the website going, we were uh, actually awarded a grant. Bill, do you want to talk about that grant? I know you guys, uh, your organization. Yep. Kind it of was a sponsorship it. from the Hudson River Greenways that helped uh, pay Henry for some of his volunteer work. Lord knows he still gave plenty of time. Uh, it, it paid Courtney to do a lot of the behind the scenes. So we had somebody that we could assign stuff to and knew that she actually got paid. We, we like that. Uh, I want to pause here for a minute and thank Jeff Miller for, um, for, for, for starting a lot of this kind of stuff and for bringing us all together. Hack really has grown out of Jeff's efforts, bringing all the, the organizations together. I remember the first time I was in the room with 30 other local historians. What a wonderful thing. We've got a lot of great people and a lot of great history. And it, it really started, you know, uh, uh, it started with Jeff's efforts and this sort of grew organically uh, uh, out, out of that uh, out of the work that Jeff has been doing for all of us too. So I, I wanna thank him for, for hosting this tonight and for inviting us here tonight, for giving us this platform. What else was yeah, I supposed to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> I think you you talked about it, the the, the grant that really helped kind oh, of that's kick, right. yeah, so kick, the kick start the, the website. Yeah. But yeah, thank you of course, Jeff, for this. And I, I, I agree, that was the first time that I actually presented at the very first uh, Ulster County History Conference. I'm, I'm an old timer now. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was just a wonderful opportunity, and I'm glad to see it's still going. By and large, it, we're a congenial bunch, I think, and, and Hack is an extension of that. We have an awful lot of fun. It's anarchy. No, but we have yet to elect a, a president or a presider, although uh, Sarah had naturally fell into that role because she was the, the Zoom host. But, uh, but it's a great bunch of people. And, and, and as a history professional working, well, I'm lucky I have a, a colleague uh, down in Atlanta who we meet remotely, and Courtney, who now lives on pointing over next door. She lives uh, in the building behind the, the canal house, she and her mom now. Um, but, uh, you know, it's great to have a community to bounce ideas off of, to develop things, to find out information. And, uh, you know, Jeff really, you know, as the, as the, as the county historian, kind of is the top of the heap, getting us all together uh, annually, or if not more, you know. But, uh, but it's really rewarding as a historian, the, the, how great everybody is how we, most of us share. There are a few people who think that history is theirs, but as a historian, I'm very generous and people are generous back. Uh, it's a wonderful community. I, I, this is my life for the rest of my life. May it be long. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're gonna go through a lot of the, the participants here um, in the next few slides, but you're absolutely right. I think once Hack started meeting, what we realized was that we have shared goals, shared interests, shared everything. And it almost became somewhat like a, like a support group through COVID that we could vent about what's going on and what's happening and um, what's annoying us. And we just had so much in common, even beyond history. It's just been a really great collaboration. So uh, the AJ Williams Myers African Roots Center was a early uh, joiner of Hack. Uh, Troy Allen Dixon, who had a background in advertising and marketing, which was super helpful with drafting language for the website and any press things that we did. Um, yeah, and she's just a, a joy to work with, really. She's been great. Uh, what's next, Bill? There's a bunch of these. We got to get through. 
Well, the Century House Historical Society, Henry Lowengard, the president and a very active hack member. He's our digital guru. He's the guy that, that, that fixes, does the back end. When you get to the hack site, and I know you're all gonna do that, you'll, you'll see uh, Henry's great work makes it seamless to navigate through. And the Century House Historical Society, I'm proud to be on their board. This is a, this is a group of a board that really wants to make even better use of what is an amazing site if you haven't been there. It celebrates the history of natural cement, a vitally important industry. Uh, this area uh, produced more than half of uh, the North America's cement in the second half of the 19th century. The Century House Historical Society is the only organization to my knowledge that celebrates this history. We have a great story to tell. And then we've got this wonderful mine that's got that been a very um, um, popular performance venue and we've done very well I, after last week's board meeting. Uh, it's, it's really helping to support the mission. Uh, you know, uh, the histories that really capture me are ones like this where you can go and see them in the ground like the DNH canal, like that you can go into a mine and really think about the lives of the, the, the men, largely immigrants who, who toiled for next to nothing, the people of color, who, who made all of this happen, who made America. Uh, and uh, if you haven't been to the Century House, it's a, it's a great site just for a, a picnic and a hike. And uh, um, we've got a nice little roadside attraction slash museum that we're gonna work on and make even better. And uh, um, onward and upward, you know? Yeah, Hack is really like the, it's like the Ulster County History Avengers. Everyone has their own their own unique uh, role to fill in it, and it's it's been great. Uh, the DNH Canal Society, yeah, Bill Merchant, he's a bit of a drag. He, he hasn't done too much to help us so far, but we're hoping to get him more involved soon. Um, Cor Courtney's been great though. I've had nothing bad to say about Courtney. She she's been uh, super helpful. Runs the social media for Hack. Um, and is there anything else you want to say about? The DNH Canal, why you got him, Bill? Um, just that we're proud to be in this historic building. We're proud that Open Space Institute, New York State Department of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation uh, um, saw fit to to uh, to to uh, grant us eight hundred thousand dollars, which really kickstarted uh, transforming this organization into a much more professional organization. Um, and we're going to have a, a wonderful Mid Hudson Visitor Center that'll open this spring. That's going to bring thousands of visitors to, to our area. Uh, and we're going to have a really exciting new uh, museum. A lot. Of, uh, it will really reward repeat visits. Uh, a lot of the work that's on DNH TV will find its way into the stuff, uh, into the, the the exhibits and, and the like. And uh, this is a, an amazing house. You'll be hard pressed to find a building this old that's this intact. They usually get remodeled. This building has an incredibly high degree of, of historical integrity. It's great that these that our state and that open space saw fit to help us. We've raised a million and a half dollars and we have to raise another half million easy, um, but we are well well along and, uh, and, and we're happy to have people like Courtney. It's great to see young people uh, um, interested in history. I, I'm fond of saying that it seems like there's a lot of oldsters, like you've got to have a history before you get interested in history. So we historians, it's like blood. We all, we all seem to really get excited and, and Courtney has really grown in, in the three years, I think she's been working for us and she's, she's made herself indispensable. Uh, she was recently has risen to be an assistant curator. Um, um, just, we just uh, raised her on, on Saturday because she's just, she's, she's great. She's wonderful to have. And Sarah Wasberg Johnson uh, um, sort of helped initiate this whole thing. I, Sarah couldn't be with us tonight, I don't think. Uh, the Maritime Museum, another great organization. It's one that I'm proud to partner with. I'm fortunate enough to to do a, to, to sail a, to, to to guide a, a trip on their solar boat about every other Sunday, a, a tour of the Upper Roundout. You don't need to go and listen to me. The boat is a, is amazing, and it's wonderful to go out on the water on this wonderful thing. But then they've also got their wooden boat school. Um, they're celebrating the whole history of the, the Hudson River, uh, and they do an, a, a great job. And if you haven't visited there, um, you really should. And the Black History Conference is coming up October 2nd that they that they put on that um, is happening at the SUNY Ulster campus this year. But there's a, a wonderful slate of speakers and uh, topics that will be discussed there that they do a wonderful job of every year. Yeah, and, and you, can, uh, you can either attend in person or virtually. I, I personally will be happy to, I'll be doing a, a, a 20 minute uh, um, presentation on the Black experience on the DNH Canal. 
I was fortunate enough to get a community foundations grant to direct my research into the marginalized populations. And it's led to just some wonderful presentations. I've got an article, I'm gonna do a plug again. I've got an article in uh, next month's Hudson River Valley Review based on that research uh, that I'm, I'm immensely proud of and I hope uh, you all get to read it. And another Sarah that's not here, take it away, Taylor. <laughs> Oh, our, our fearless leader, Sarah Litvin, um, who really took charge of Hack early on and was the uh, one who scheduled and ran all of the meetings. Um, but the, the Rear Center has just been doing fantastic work now that it's um, open. They're giving tours. I collaborated with Sarah on um, a, an exhibit stitched together where we worked with uh, fourth grade students to teach the history of the uh, women who worked in the garment industries in Kingston. And the students did presentations on some of the women that we were able to find census records for. And then I believe um, they had students that actually sewed some, some garments uh, as well. And so they, they had some experience with what these women working in the garment industries would have experienced. And Sarah, Sarah's just, I don't think Hack would exist without uh, Sarah Litvin or Sarah Wasberg Johnson, all the credit goes to them for getting it started. Um, and um, yeah, I, I can't, we can't say enough about her. Go on, Bill. We're so infatuated with the Sarahs that we forget to mention that Jeff, I believe, was really the guiding light of the Rear Center. He must be immensely proud of the work that they're doing there. And it's always great when you have an idea and a thing and then to see it take off. He's, he's got to have the same sense of pride <clears throat> when he goes to the Rear Center that I have in this building here that, that uh, to, to be advancing these, these important community stories. Absolutely. And it's back to you, Taylor. <laughs> Did we skip the Senate House? Did we skip it? Wait, you know, yeah, sometimes those buttons, oh, yeah, but it's still back to you. Taylor. It happened quick, but it's still back to me. The Senate House, state historic site. Aaron Robinson uh, has been also wonderful to work with. He's been contributing a lot. Um, the most recent article that we have in the Kingston Wire um, was written by him. And that's, that's another thing we haven't mentioned yet. We have a, a, a bi-weekly article. The Kingston Wire was generous enough to give us um, uh, basically a, a slot bi-weekly that we can write an article about history. So the members of Hack, it's been rotating and every two weeks there's a new Hack article coming out in the Kingston Wire that is, it is a free article. You do need to sign up um, to read it, but you can sign up with a free account and we made sure that the articles are totally free uh, so that, you know, history isn't locked behind any doors and that everyone can access it if, if need be. But uh, as a board member of the Senate House, um, I can tell you that it is now open again. There was renovations being done in the Senate House itself um, for the last year, pretty much. And it's now open and everybody should go check it out. And I'm sure they're going to play an integral part in Kingston's celebration of the 250th anniversary of the Rev War in a few years. Um, they have a really deep Rev War history and some great collections too, the largest collection of John Vanderlyn paintings. Um, the, the Senate House Gallery is just amazing. So we're, we're happy to have them. They also give us that statewide context. So it's, it's really not just Kingston, it's not just Ulster County. Uh, the Senate House has a state historic site, kind of brings the whole state into it, which is nice. And we so enjoy hearing you talk, Taylor, that I think you've got, you might have the next two even, I have a feeling. Uh -oh. Well, the Ol Ulster County Archives gives us that countywide context, which is good. But uh, yeah, the Ol Ulster County Archives, I mean, I can't say enough about Nina Posterpeck, our county clerk, who has been really so engaged with local history for basically the past 30 years. Um, she's the reason that we have the Person House, the historic Stone House Museum on the Four Corners. That's why uh, we're the ones that submitted the Four Corners Pomeroy sign. We, we have one of the Four Corners. <laughs> and uh, we opened the Person House up to the community and to other cultural groups. Bill was a guest host earlier this year. Um, every Saturday, we, we invite other groups to come and basically take the house over and showcase what they have since we are a countywide government site. Um, we want to make sure to be inclusive and bring everyone else in. And we also have a robust archives with some of the uh, largest collection of Dutch records in New York State. So 
Yeah, we, we are the Ulster County's history department. That is not Jeff. <laughs> so it's great to work with Jeff um, and just bring history out to the public. I also would just, uh, Nina, it, it, I, I'm in my fourth year of a call-in radio program on WKCR, and I now get to share it with, with, uh, with Nina as my host. It's a hoot. It, it, uh, the half hour goes so quick that uh, because there's just so much to talk about uh, history. And there's so many people who love the history in this area. We're, we're, we're unique in that. Very and true. we're lucky to have Nina too. She's great. I love the Fred Johnston Museum. I just think it's an amazing thing to have. Uh, uh, I just, he, the guy, he, you know, some of that stuff is so nice. It looks like it's a repro. He just, he was collecting stuff at just the right time. But Taylor, I think you, you, you're on this board too, aren't you? I'm on this board too. I'm, I'm the secretary of the, the Friends of Restore Kingston. And uh, yeah, what a wonderful job they did with their new exhibit, the Majeska Sign exhibit. Um, they, of course, their, their main focus is historic preservation generally and um, making sure that, that Kingston's historic sites are preserved. They recently had a, uh, well, <laughs> we're going to have a ribbon cutting at Frog Alley to, um, announced that the Frog Alley ruins are now res restored. They are safe. It is now a, a little pocket park there. Um, so they were able to save one of the oldest ruins in Kingston. They have a great new uh, exhibit about the Majeska Sign Company who designed and fabricated signs all throughout Kingston. Um, geez, I don't know when they started. I should know this. Something like 1940 or 50. And the family generously donated a handful of photo albums. Every time they put a sign up in the city, they would take a photo of it. So they had this great collection of Kingston history of virtually every business that was um, that had a new sign put up within that date span. And there, there's a great new exhibit there. Jane Keller, she was one of the early adopters of Hack. I know Sarah Litvin called Jane Keller, I think, first and said, is this something that you think is possible? And Jane, Jane said, you know, We've been trying to do it for a long time and it's never worked. So COVID was really that spark that forced uh, forced it in a way. And it's it's just turned out to be be wonderful. So yeah, thanks for the Friends of Restore Kingston and Jane for all they do. It's fantastic. And uh, Nancy Chan though, I think, right? Is Nancy's also involved? Uh, yes, she, yep. she her, her term as president um, just came up. She is still doing the, the walking tours for the Friends. Um, but yeah, of course, Nancy, you probably hear her on the radio a couple times a week, some weeks, or see her with a group of people walking through the old Dutch church burial ground, telling them about each of the headstones. Um, Nancy, Nancy probably knows more Kingston history than, than uh, I hesitate to say anybody, because there's Pete Roberts is also other friends, and he's, he's pretty good too. But that's, that's, they're, they're a strong group of people for sure. But wait, there's more. <laughs> the Hurley. Oh, so is it well, and, and and you know your organization, your your name here, people. Um, we, you know this is a this is a very uh, egalitarian bunch of people. We haven't even bothered to elect officers. It it just seems to, I don't know. It just but the Hurley Heritage Society, unfortunately, they had Blauweiss scheduled tonight. Uh, um, Stephen Blauweiss and and and. Uh, and and Karen have done wonderful stuff with local history. And in fact, they're presenting, I believe it's some um, black culture in Ulster County, I think is there a, a tonight. Theater on the Road, Frank and his group have been really busy. I know that they, uh, they, did, uh, present, they did three nights, sold out nights in the Widow Jane Mine for the Century House Historical Society. They had a sold out uh, night at the Bevere House, Ulster County Historical recently. Uh, COVID uh, with people getting vaccinated and uh, we're all trying to reclaim our lives and these in-person things have just been wonderful and Theater frank designed our logo that's right thank you for that yeah <laughs> yeah ulster county historical society uh, involved uh, through various uh, members uh, courtney is on that board myself as vice president uh marion mccorkle our uh, president these days uh has been an, a, a a member off and on and has done some of our artwork for us um the Volunteer Firemen's Hall and Museum of Kingston. We're, we're at all of the earliest meetings. They've got a great uh, history and story to tell right there in Kingston. 
Christina Fuerta um, joined because she's part of the design team that's doing the work here uh, for the new museum uh, for the DNH Canal Historical Society. She's an ama a boy, you know, I turned to her the other day and just said, you know, I, we're winding down, we're in, we're in uh, a fabrication, so there's very little, but I, I turned to her and just said, isn't there some other project we can work on? We, we just, we're, we're simpatico, she's great. She's had a lot of great, um, um, been, been a big help in, uh, in hack as just an independent history person. Her main business is designing uh, exhibits and she and Paul, Paul Orselli really know what they're doing. They know their stuff. And I tell everybody, I probably know more about the DNH history than anybody, but I'm not, and, and I'm probably full of myself, but I'm not so full of myself that I thought I should design this museum. Uh, and, and Christina and, and Paul are, are um, sort of the top of their field but for people who understand how to get your stories across in an engaging and relevant way. Uh, um, and so we couldn't be happier. I wanna pull her into every one of my museums if we can, uh, if we can find the funding. That's a whole thing we for someday we should do, Jeff, on just trying to get yourself funded as a, as a nonprofit. Uh, I'm proud of the amount of grants that we've managed to get here, but it's a tough, as we all know, any of you in this, it's a tough field and it ain't getting any easier, you know. Uh, Frances Catherine was working at, uh, um, she's an independent historian, um, but she's been a very active member. She's worked for Historic Huguenot Street and others. Uh, you can go to her WIP projects and see the wonderful work that she's doing. Uh, uh, she's another individual member. Chester Hartwell, I didn't put Chester's name up here. Um, um, oh. Quick, I'll add it now. Uh, Chester, if any of you know local history, know that Chester, he's removed himself to, to Florida. Uh, um, his wife made him go. He loves Socrates and all things local history. Anybody on Facebook knows Chester. Chester's been a, another uh, uh, in and out member uh, in that, that the, uh, the, the, the wonderful sort of uh, uh, um, I know we, you know, I don't want to say what is hack really, you know, it's a, it's, it's a, well, here's hack. Well, well here's hack. So Bill, yes, we, I know Jeff told us to be long winded, but I think it's almost eight fifteen. So here's hack. Okay. You're here, gonna, here's, you know, let me move it up. We just, we wanted to praise everybody because we love them all so much. There's well, Courtney, I think no, that's right? important. There's Troy Ellen. I just thought there's Henry, uh, Sarah Libman, Christina, oh, Lori Hancock. We neglected to mention Lori, but we've got her on a slide. Sarah Wasberg Johnson, you you could put faces on the names that we've that you've heard here today tonight. So um, I'm going to breeze through the uh, scavenger hunt that we did because I think we, I want to focus a little more on the 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 Black History Project. Well, and you know, Taylor, I think we just have to say go to this the history hunt. We we've, we've got a, 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 a what is it? There's a question hunt. We've got many different kinds of hunts. You want to take it from here, but we can quickly. People really just need to go and and uh, and, and see. Go the, check it out. Now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so this this was the first piece of digital content that we did. We we realized everything was closed, so uh, the content that we produced obviously had to be things that were outside. So we thought initially of a scavenger hunt, but you're not really looking for any specific things. So we marketed it as a history hunt. Um, and uh, if you go to the next slide, Bill, there there's a, a number of different history hunts on there. I think we have two history hunts, one for uh, downtown for Pinkaki, where I grew up, which is amazing. And I think a bit of Kingston that is often forgotten about um, that. I think if anyone has a chance before it starts to snow, go do that Pinkaki hunt. And then we have a, uh, a spooky historic cemetery hunt in Montrepo Cemetery that has a large list of names. I don't, and you will you only have to find I think ten, but there's something like twenty or thirty names in there. And um, that was a wonderful project because it was the first time and only time that Hack met in person was to go to the cemetery and find some of these historic names. So definitely go online, check it out. Um, and and that, it's that season again too. It, it, it couldn't be more relevant. October's right around the corner. Go, go do the, these. These hunts are up there still. We'll still give prizes. Um, we have we have uh, so, some some wonderful history related prizes, and uh, we'd like to hopefully tonight we'll, we'll get some more traffic, get people going there again. Here's yeah, a little more. So. Just a. I'm going to go through these slides a little quicker now because you should all go. So the spirit of Halloween. So, um, oh, and now right up to. The Hudson Valley Black History Collaborative Research. Do you want to take it, Taylor? Or? Yeah, I'll give the intro here. So this is um, the project that we wanted to do after that. This it was coming up on Black History Month, and we said, well, we're all meeting weekly. So how can we how can we celebrate and commemorate Black History Month? And um, something that we all really hoped 
would exist is some kind of central repository where um, you can see the, the black history resources that all of our different repositories had. So we decided to go ahead and do it. And the Hudson Valley uh, Black History Collaborative Research Project was intended for our different organizations to put what we had in our repositories related to black history and then open it up to the public um, to see what other places had and what other people have. So we, we wanted, we put a call out, we did a presentation on this on fe in February um, to have people, if you have stories, if you have photos, if you um, have journals, anything like that, um, we, we want to add it to the repository so that anybody doing black history research in uh, Ulster County can go there first because it is notoriously difficult to research marginalized people. Like Bill said at one of our meetings, they're called marginalized for a reason. They live on the margins of history. They're not easy to research. So we tried to make that process easier for people by um, doing this project. And so this is uh, the sheet for it. You know, one of the things I discovered in my own research on the DNH women are the most marginalized. They're even harder. They're ignored by history even more than people of color, which is saying something, right? Um, so a shout out and, and uh, women of color, you really have my sympathy because, you know, you wanna talk about being marginalized. It's really, but hopefully we're gonna become better people and better citizens and, and learn these stories. And, and, and uh, um, because we're really talking about the people that built our country. So we, uh, we beg any of you to, to, uh, to go and visit it's a, a simple Google form. Uh, you know, we're asking even general public, people just put up resources if they've got them. Um, we just, we'd like to think that this will be a living thing that'll go on for a long time. And we welcome opportunities like this to get it out in the public eye again. Um, yeah, and again, th this is right on the website. This is just a separate tab on the site. There's a HV uh, Black History Project. You click that, you have this form. And this is even if you've done research in the past, if you know that, oh, Senate House has this one journal that mentions this, we want to know that. That that can all go right in this, this spreadsheet um, so that researchers in the future can just go there and not have to go to 40 different places to find out what they have. They can go to one place and then go from there. And this is the, the last slide, I think, on, the, on that. Uh, well, and it leads right up to the conference the week from Saturday. Um, I, I'm very excited to be both able to, to, I was going to be attending no matter what, but I'm, I'm really pleased that I, that I get to uh, present to people as well. And uh, um, we hope uh, to see all of you there. Um, in fact, the African Roots Center Archival Research inter Intern will be pre presenting the Green Book Project at that co conference. I don't know if you know about the Green Book, but uh, uh, people of color had a hard time. Lots of places wouldn't let them go. They had their own guide, so you could be the Green Book. In the 20th century, when, when, after the Great Migration, if you historians know about that, um, uh, um, the, the Green Book was a way for them to find safe places, find places where they wouldn't be discriminated against or at least be able to use the bathrooms and buy some food. So that's a, that's a story that deserves to have more people hear it. And I'm really glad that, that, uh, that instead of having 60 year old white guys like myself presenting on this topic, that we're gonna have people of color as well. I think that's important, you know. And then uh, this is this is at the the last slide on our little thing, and it's uh, in fact I'll even stop sharing my screen now. What do you say? Perfect. Well, thank you again, Jeff, for having us. We've got about ten minutes here for questions. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Thanks, Bill. Thank you, Taylor. This is the first time Taylor and I have done this together. It really I didn't realize he talks as much as me. It's <laughs> <laughs> Jeff told us to be long winded. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Didn't I tell you nobody would care if we were short yesterday when we or when we oh well. <laughs> oh, this is the uh, the most the most entertaining team on uh, that I've heard since click and clack, uh, you know, <laughs> on P on uh, and NPR, and I know where to go from now on when I need an ego boost. So thanks a lot for presenting. And uh, we're open for questions if anyone has a question to ask. You know, you know, Jeff, too, I just think it's great because too often I think, uh, you know, I feel like a lot of people know me, but I think a lot of times historians are, are laboring on their own and people don't necessarily get a chance to appreciate the wonderful work they do for us as a community. So, you know, it, it's just, it's, it's long overdue, you know. 
Yeah, one of the things I wanted to add is that I think the nicest thing that happened to me um, when I became the Ulster County historian was to find myself in a group of people that are dedicated to this particular field and aren't in it for the money because- <laughs> There's money? Oh wait, I get paid. There's money in this? <laughs> so oh. it's just pure love and dedication that fuels this, this whole, uh, this, apparatus here and it's really great and it's a it's it's a wonderful group to be a part of so thank you thank you so questions questions it looked like maybe pamela had her hand raised not electronically but uh i think karen might have to unmute you i'm not sure Oh, okay. I guess I'm unmuted. I just yeah. want to really thank you. I do not live on on the East Coast. I live on the West Coast. Um, I have done geological research for a long time. I have um, about 10 references to Kingston back in the 16 and 1700s. And I want to tell you how much I appreciate, first of all, the last year and a half of getting to know this area and um, being able to get the different layers of different things. You know, it's just amazing to me. And you guys are so personable. I would like to get involved. I have heard of both of you and I've listened to um, things about the DNH Canal. Um, I get the email, well, I don't get the email, but I get on my laptop um, when you have the YouTube videos on there. But I'd like to get more involved with me. I've been taking notes. And I'm listen, I'm not saying any of this to impress anybody. I'm just an average lady <laughs> living my life, but I am so tickled. And I just, for me, Ulster County just is beginning to have a really special glow to it to me. And, you know, so that's one good thing about this horrible pandemic is that I would, you would have been names and I would have emailed you and stuff like that. I would never have had this privilege of, of monthly meetings and things like that, but that's all I'm going to say. But I may get more and more involved. I'm just so jazzed by what you guys have said tonight. Well, you know, Pamela, you remind us all that nobody owns history. It's all of ours mm -hmm. and we all are the better for it. And everybody can, if they want, contribute. Certainly feel free to reach out to, to me at the Canal Museum if there's anything you're interested in. I love hearing from, from the people out and about. I have an awful lot of contacts in the historic community. I'm not, ju not just about the DNH. Uh, although they do pay me to talk about that, fortunately. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah. that's kind of saying. Thank I'm you so much. <laughs> yeah. And Pamela, if, if you ever find yourself on, on the East Coast, come, we, we give tours of the archives. We, we'd be happy to show you some of those old records. Hopefully we can find some of your ancestor signatures and stuff. We love working with genealogists. Thank you. Oh, there's Chester. Sorry, I forgot to put your name on the slide, Chester. Next time. Were there any other questions or? All in all, all done. As my auctioneer friend would say. <laughs> Uh, we have Richard would like to ask. Oh, okay. I just, well, I don't really have much of a question. I just want to thank you guys for the old work you're doing. It's really impressive. And uh, living up here in the mountains, we don't get uh, communications too quickly, but uh, uh, I'll be in touch on some of the black history research and, and things like that. You know, the, the, the Pony Express that only gets here every two weeks. So, hey, you know, they've got the <laughs> telegraph now, Richard. We can get really? you on. Really? And, and by the way, you, your, your book on that, uh, on the Woodstock story about the, the person of color, uh, fascinating, uh, happy, uh, was a, a great read and some great research. So thank kudos. you. I'll get, 
I'll get you, I'll, I'll be in touch and submit whatever I can submit from that because it, you know, it's sitting on my hard drive. What do I, you know, I should share. Wow. So, and I, I actually, I, I referred a researcher to your book today, Richard. It, it really okay, well, is a, a wonderful resource. That and the buck 50 will get me a tea, I guess. Yeah. Coffee yeah, we're, somewhere. we're all in this for the money, Richard. You know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know that. I know that. Okay. But thank you. I just want to, now if you, I'm going to get the Historical Society of Woodstock to be in touch and join up. Uh, when, when you get on, uh, when you join up, do you have a link to that organization or uh, to the YouTube channel? I mean, how does that work? Probably the, there's a, there should be an, a, a contact email on the web page. You could start there or you can contact any one of us. No, no, directly. I'm asking if, if say the Historical Society of Woodstock joins up, which I'm sure we will, uh, and you put us up there on, on your website, there's a link back to us or? Uh, yes. That type of thing. God bless you. Of, Henry makes that magic happen. There's a lot of us established YouTube channels uh, over the course of the pandemic and things like that. So there's a lot of stuff out there that I think needs to get out there and at least be shared. Uh, more than it is. But thank you guys. You do great work. Well, thank, well, thank you, you for that, Richard. Join in. Uh, we, we, we are, we've, uh, we've all gotten so busy, we need to schedule another meeting. Uh, but we were always open to new ideas and other ways. You know, this is a very like organic and open uh, process that I hope will continue for the rest of my life, which I hope will be for a long time. You know? <laughs> I'll check on that telegraph thing. Okay. Yep. <laughs> uh, Henry wanted to Make a comment or question? Sure. Well, um, I've been pretty much uh, associated with Hack pretty much from the beginning. Uh, I just wanted to mention that I updated the website a little bit today so that the history hunt isn't so tied to 2020. Um, you can do it any old time. I kind of took the raffle out because it was kind of more trouble than it was worth. But um, I also linked in. Um, the, uh, the spreadsheet uh, table page that I built out of the spreadsheet of Black History resources into the Black History, uh, Hudson Valley Black History Research Project page that's in there. And uh, even so, uh, you know, now a lot of us have gone back to actually doing museum work and it's, we don't uh, run into each other as much as possible. But when we do, <laughs> we come up with plans like Taylor has a, flyer or a, uh, a takeaway that supposedly is getting printed, uh, which will be around that again, includes, um, you know, just uh, references to all of our associated uh, associations, so that uh, if you're in town and you want to find something to do, uh, certainly um, there will be a nice list with website addresses for everybody, I think is how it ended up being. So, um, so that's the kind of thing that Hack is really about, is like getting um, communication between these resources that makes sense for more than one organization to be working on a project. And, um, you know, uh, there already was something like that, but this way it's spread out to more historical societies. And uh, there are plenty more. <laughs> we, kind of, we kind of cut off joining last year to see how well the situation works. So, when we meet together, we'll see about adding in. Obviously, Woodstock is an obvious uh, historical society to add in. Uh, same thing with the Klein Museum, you know, all these other places uh, in the area that we are currently not amongst our uh, historical museums, but obviously could be. So yeah, the, uh, the work continues. Thanks, Henry. And I, I can confirm the, the city of Kingston, I twisted their arm a bit and they generously uh, agreed, paid for, and we printed 500 uh, rack cards that are going to be distributed to all of the participating organizations in the next week or so that has uh, all the information about the different uh, currently contributing folks in Hack. And there is a QR code on it that if you have a smartphone, just put it right up and click it and it brings up the website with all of our scavenger hunts the, and the Black History Project and all of that. So um, yeah, those are done, those are printed and I just haven't told you yet. <laughs> well, this, this will suffice to be one of our meetings. There you go. Anyone else last qu question or two? Okay, well, 
I wish to thank you all for participating, um, both the participants and the people that came and joined us this, this evening. I want to thank the committee that works with me, um, and I wish I could say all their names, but I forget. So I'm afraid to, but Karen is one. Karen Le Levine, who was the Zoom Meister for this. Richard is another one. Um, Susan Stesson Cohen, uh, uh, Joan uh, Kelly, um, Susan Hausberg, Susan uh, uh, Sprackman. Um, who else am I missing? Audrey Klinkenberg. Um, it's it's uh, very. Oh, Marty. Pardon me. Oh, Mar Marnie yeah. Jan Jansen, right? It's so it's an incredible group of people uh, Gail. working Gail. on this. Oh yes, Gail Manny. Yeah. Um, mixture of uh, historic sites, town historians, uh, technical wi wizards. Um, it's 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 great. And so, <clears throat> Ulster County is a wonderful place. We have a lot of good people that are working on a lot of great topics, and I happy that I could bring tonight's presentations um, to, to you and we look forward to doing more. So thank you for coming, all of you, and we will see you on December 9th, I hope, when Toby Carey will present his film and talk about his te techniques and re research uh, that go into them. So thank you. Thank you. I just want, uh, Ray had wanted to make a little announcement. He lost power and he is back. So, ah, Ray, uh, yes. We'll bring him on just briefly. Thank you. Uh, am I on? Yes. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so my the power just suddenly went out and managed to get back on. I wanted to mention the um, AFNES, which is the Association of Public Historians of New York State. Um, it's the organization of the municipally government appointed historians and I'm their second vice president and actually Taylor is joining our board uh, next year. And, uh, but the reason I wanted to mention that organization is because next September our annual meeting will be in Kingston. And this has been a very useful presentation because now I've got a number of ideas of different tours we can do and we're kind of limited and you guys have too many choices so but I've got Taylor and Jeff. Um, I know I've already got involved on the committee. Um, we, will, we, we have a local arrangements committee and we have a program committee and I'm already getting a couple ideas for speakers too. Um, I remember AJ Williams Myers. I met him years ago when I was involved with the Eleanor Roosevelt Center. So I'm hoping, you know, maybe we can get him in. But anyway, uh, I just wanted to mention that. Excuse um, me, Dr. Williams Myers has passed on. Oh no, when, when was that? Um, a couple of months ago. I don't remember. The oh, exact. dear. I'm really sorry to hear that. Um, yes. But anyway, um, so I just want to let you know, we'll probably be picking a number of your brains as we um, do this conference uh, next year. It's, a, it's usually it's a, a two and a half day conference. Uh, we just did it in Oswego and we had a, a mixture of in-person and virtual and we'll be doing that again because there are some people who like the virtual. But Anyway, kind of wanted to let you know that um, we're going to be pestering you a lot. And as I said, this presentation was really useful. And by the way, the title of our conference is um, Expanding the Narrative. I wonder where we got that from. <laughs> so uh, we thought our president looked at us and goes, that's a great, that's a great topic because it's exactly what we need to be doing as historians. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Thanks, Thank Ray. Thank you. Yep. Okay, anyone else? All in, all done? Keep your power. <laughs> okay. Mine's gone on twice. Take Thanks care. Take care. Thank you so much. Okay, good night. Good night.